So what exactly is the right price? Well, let's just say there's a whole lot of science around that question, and we'll dig in on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shaw. Well, welcome everyone to The Buyer's Mind, where we investigate exactly what's going on in the brains of prospects who are considering a purchase decision. That's what this podcast is all about. It's about taking a stroll through the mind of the buyer. It's about getting to know that customer so well that the sale begins to roll out right in front of you. I'm your host, Jeff Shaw. You can read the full bio in the show notes. You can also go over to jeffshore.com. Uh, make sure you sign up for our free Saturday newsletter, a little Saturday morning inspiration to help you on your journey. As always, welcome by our show producer, Mr. Paul Murphy. Murph, how's it going today? It's going really well. So we're going to be talking today about pricing psychology with uh, Dr. Kit Yarrow. It's a it's an amazing uh, conversation, and I, you know, I'm just looking at it from the perspective of of uh, what is sometimes referred to as the price quality heuristic. So, Murph, here's the idea: uh, you're going to have friends over, and you know your friends like steak, but let's suppose for a moment that you don't need steak that much, and you really don't know. So you go to the store, you're standing there in in the, the meat section, and you're looking at all these different cuts of steak. How do you decide which cut of steak you're going to buy if you really don't know your steak cuts all that well? Well, I mean, as you're looking at the steaks, you're looking at size, you're looking at thickness, you're looking at all those things, but one of the things you're looking at, of course, is price, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you don't want to be cheap and get hamburger, but you don't want to get filet mignon because mm -hmm. that'll blow the budget. So you're trying to find that middle ground that makes you look like you spent a little money on your friends, right? <laughs> it's kind of funny how that works, too, because even in that decision right there, there's a whole lot to unpack. I mean, you know, how much do they like steak? How much do I like steak? How much do I like these friends? What is their taste? What is their budget? What do they normally eat? And it's funny because at the end of the day, uh, we are going to look at it and we're going to use that, what is sometimes called the price quality heuristic. We're, we're going to think, well, I'm spending more it must be a better steak. And that's kind of what we're going to get into today, talking to Kit Yarrow, because the psychology of pricing is really, really interesting. But let me give you a, a quote of the day. I, I first heard this quote, boy, I, it was, I, I was a teenager. I, I, I don't remember where I saw the quote, but I remember this striking me as a teenager, and it has stuck with me, and it's perfect for today's episode. It's from John Ruskin, and this is what he says. There is scarcely anything in the world that some man cannot make a little worse and sell a little more cheaply, and the person who buys on price alone is this man's lawful prey. Boy, that's really something. <laughs> this man's lawful prey. Well, look, let me look at it this way. When is a good deal not really a good deal? Well, I often say that there's no such thing as a good deal on something that you don't like very much. And I have evidence for that. And I would just ask you and challenge you right now, uh, how many of you out there uh, have an item of clothing that you have owned for 30 days or more and it still has the price tag on it? And my guess is the majority of you said, yes, I have an item of clothing I've owned for 30 days or more, still has the price tag on it. I'm also going to suggest that there's a really good chance that the item of clothing you're thinking about was purchased on sale. But by contrast, if you paid full price for something that you were wearing right now, how soon after you purchased it did you wear it? And my guess is that you wore it right away. That's what tends to happen. There's a corollary quote here from Thomas Paine who says, that which we obtain too easily, we esteem too lightly. And so if you think about it from that perspective, there is the idea that price can be a very misguiding, misleading thing. And there's some something deceptive about price as it relates to an evaluation tool. So today's guest, Kit Yarrow, is, is, she studied these things in great depth. You're going to love that conversation. Hey, we want to let you know that the podcast is brought to you in part by our good friends at Home Street Bank. They are our show sponsor. They're also my lender of choice. I used Home Street the last time I purchased a home. I have to tell you, it was the smoothest transaction I've ever had, and I have purchased quite a few homes. Uh, they were professional, they were dependable, great rates, fantastic service. 
If you're a real estate professional, you're just not going to find better people when it comes to taking care of your clients. So whether it's banking, home loans, credit lines, whatever it happens to be, go to homestreetbank.com to learn more. That's homestreetbank.com. Well, before we get to our interview, let me give you your tip of the day, and it is this. The earlier you talk about price, the more you jeopardize the sale. All right, let me just say that again. The earlier you talk about price, the more you jeopardize the sale. A detailed conversation about price and terms too early on will only get you into trouble. And let me tell you why. Because the discussion on price lacks context. Let's just think about it for just a moment. Let's say we walk into my clothing store and I said, hey, good news, I've got a shirt at 50% off. Would you like to buy it? Now, that would be silly because we haven't determined whether you want a shirt. We haven't shown you. We have no idea whether it's the right size, whether it's the right, whether you even like the shirt. But now we're talking about price. It doesn't make any sense at all. Why? Because the discussion lacks context. So when we get into a discussion about price before we have fully unpacked the needs of the customer and the problem they're trying to solve and the viability of our product or service to be able to do that, we're missing huge points of context. We're talking about price in the absence of any kind of emotional commitment to the product, and that is very dangerous. Just think about a car dealer. Can you imagine walking into a car dealership where they say, we're gonna do things a little differently here, my friends. We're gonna take you into the back room and put you down in a cubicle with our finance manager, and he's gonna fill out this funky worksheet, and, and you're gonna haggle on a price, and at one point he's gonna look at you and say, oh, I'm gonna get fired if I take this deal and my kids don't want to be able to afford their education. You're going to go through that whole process. You're finally going to arrive at a price and then you're going to go on a test drive. I mean, that would be crazy. That would be absolutely ridiculous. So I want to suggest you when a customer is bringing up price early on in the process, make that general statement and you have to have this down. You got to have it down solid. You, you got to make that general statement just enough to take the price discussion off the table, especially the detailed price discussion. So you might be able to look at it and say, well, listen, we can, you know, if, if for example, you're selling, uh, I don't know, recreational vehicles, and you might look at it and say, listen, you can spend uh, a $40,000, you can spend $150,000. It, it, it's so different. But listen, we can go into that in more detail once we determine whether we have something that works for you. Or if you're selling homes, you could say, oh, well, our homes start at 340, they go up into the 380s, but you know what we really need to do is figure out whether we have something that works for you. So we'll go into detail on the price once we determine uh, that we've got what you're looking for. So what are we saying to the customer? Hey, that pricing discussion, so noted, it's on the agenda, we're going to get to it, we're just not going to get to it yet. So if you have to give out a very vague uh, sense of what the prices are going to be, that's fine. But do not get into a detailed price conversation. It's only going to get you in trouble. I want to invite you to join us for the 2017 Jeff Shore Sales Leadership Summit and Expo. This is to help you become a better leader for your team, to grow your business in ways you never thought possible, and take your career to the next level. This is the premier gathering for real estate sales executives. Although I have to tell you, uh, we've had people from all different industries, and they've always gotten so much out of this. But the target lessons are for real estate executives, and you're going to learn from the best of the best about what it takes to make you a better leader, manager, and coach, more insights, more strategies, and more aha moments than ever before. We've been doing these summits for years, and they just keep getting bigger and better. Hundreds of leaders from all around North America, and actually all around the world, descend on Coronado. That's right, just outside of San Diego at the Lowe's Coronado Resort. Uh, bring your significant other. Stay for a few days. We meet on Thursday and Friday, but most people spend the weekend. And listen, there are worse places to be in August than Coronado Island in San Diego. It's absolutely spectacular. If you're interested in attending the summit, just visit jeffshore.com slash summit. And if you use the promo code buyer's mind, just all one word, no apostrophe, buyer's mind, we'll take $200 off the registration price. All righty. Well, let's get to our interview. I first came across Dr. Kit Yarrow when I read her most excellent book, Decoding the New Consumer Mind. It was a great book. 
and that led me to her blog, and I've been a fan ever since. Uh, Kit Yarrow is an award-winning consumer psychologist. She's a professor, she's an author, she's a consultant, she's a speaker. Uh, she teaches at Golden Gate University in San Francisco, where she is Professor Emerita. Uh, she's an expert in consumer psychology uh, and an incredibly insightful uh, individual. Well, welcome to the show, Kit. Glad to have you. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. And let's let's have some fun. I, I, I absolutely love the book, Decoding the New Consumer Mind. And I, I just want to sort of walk through the book. I've got, uh, I, I wasted a couple of, uh, of stacks of post-it notes on the pages here. So <laughs> I, I know we'll get to everything, but we'll give it a, a shot. But let's, let's start with a title because uh, the cover of the book, and we'll put this in the show notes here, but the cover of the book, Decoding the New Consumer Mind as compared to the old consumer mind. So just mm -hmm. let's start right there. Why the title? and what is it about the new consumer mind that piques your interest? Yeah, I think because of a few sociocultural shifts, namely our use of technology, a much more individualistic society, a lot more emotionality. Because of these sociocultural shifts, I think that we think differently. You know, our minds are malleable. What we use becomes stronger. What we don't becomes weaker. And so I think because of these shifts, we actually are psychologically different. And that means what we want to buy, how we make decisions about what to buy, how we connect to brands, all these things have changed as well. It's interesting because uh, these things have changed and are changing. And yet, if you speak from your academic background for a, a moment here, we see a corollary phenomenon that that which we are learning about the brain is all relatively new, right? A, a lot of the experts that we've had have said that that the whole idea, the study of behavioral economics and even uh, uh, the neuroscience of the brain, th this is all pretty fresh stuff. Yeah, I I remember actually sitting in a college economics class and thinking to myself, but that's not how we do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. And I think, so the old kind of rational man, and I think that it's called rational man instead mm -hmm. of person tells you how old it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the old rational man theory, which is that people buy according to their own self-interest only, mm -hmm. um, is, is really doesn't make sense because people actually buy things, spend money, a, a lot around re our connectedness to other people and sense of fairness. And, you know, all these psychological constructs are really, really important. It's really not just a logical decision. There's so much emotion and so much psychology. And right, that is really new. And and now we can actually kind of look into the brain with some of our new neuropsychology techniques. And, mm -hmm. and we're seeing, you know, and we have proof of all of this. Right. You know, it's give us a little peek behind the curtain there, Kit, because like uh, when I read uh, Richard Thaler's book Nudge, for example, he he spends a so lot good. of time. It's such a good book. He spends a lot of time contrasting the 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 way that an econ would make a decision versus the way that a real person would make a decision, and and so you know those who are only focusing on the economics are looking at pure logic. But a big part, a big sub theme of your entire book is beware the emotion state, right? Yeah. So, you know, when I give speeches, a lot of times I'll start it out with an experiment, actually, that Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize in mm -hmm. economics, even though he's a psychologist, used. Right. And that's, you ask, you give a couple, two people, um, $10, and you say, you can divide that up any way you want. Um and one person's gonna make the decision and then the other person's gonna say yes or no. And typically people will give $5 and the other person will take that $5 rather than to get nothing. But that is completely irrational. Rational man economic theory would say that it would be smartest to give a dollar, therefore you get to keep the most. And the person would take a dollar because that's better than nothing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yet always, and, and you know, and I've done this all over the world, always people pretty much settle around $5 because they're more governed by rules of fairness and mm -hmm. human connection mm -hmm. than they are maximizing their gain. And that also takes place in the marketplace. I mean, a lot of people push back and say, oh, but you know, that's one-on-one. -on -one. What about when people are in stores? And we have ample research that suggests that also in any sort of buying situation, people are factoring in not just how do I get the most, but also what's fair and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, what connects me with other people. Let's get into this. You state very, very clearly early in the book that people buy 
in order to elevate their emotional state. And, you know, this is something that we see a lot of, and and uh, most of modern research is telling us that we have probably underplayed the role of emotion. Is there a way to sort of measure that? To, to what extent do people buy to elevate their emotional state? Because, of course, the, the logical components have to be in place. It's not like we lose track of our rational mind here. But is there a way to, to measure just how much of a purchase decision is made on emotion versus logic? You know, I think that would vary a lot depending on the category. So, mm -hmm. for example, when somebody's buying a house, of course, there would be a little bit more logic, mm -hmm. <laughs> let's hope at least, yeah. involved in that. Although, interestingly enough, when people are buying cars, they are just as emotional as when they're buying wine. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> a lot yeah. of research has shown a purchase like that. Typically, the higher the risk, which means, you know, will it affect my health? How much will it affect my pocketbook? How long will I keep the product? These things, these sorts of things elevate the risk of a product and riskier products, people tend to factor in a little bit more logic mm -hmm. um, to the equation. Although I would say that it's still primarily an emotional decision in, in a place like Europe, the United States and developed countries where we have a, so many options, and B, so much stuff already, mm -hmm. and C, you know, our stuff is so reflective of, um, you know, our connectedness to other people. Right, right. We had uh, Peter Noel Murray on, who talked specifically about the idea of luxury purchases and how the, the more of a luxury purchase it is, the more of the emotion needs to be engaged just from the perspective of how do I justify this? It's, it's difficult to justify an ultra luxury purchase on logic alone. You have to have that strong presence of emotion just to be able to say, to be able to make up a story as to why this makes sense to me, right? <laughs> Such an important point. I mean, yeah. that's a really good point. And, you know, and it's interesting too, that in this new world that we live in, the new consumer brain is actually um, e evaluating a luxury purchase differently today too. You know, a lot of luxury now has to do with hassle reduction, how easy it is to buy something, how much um, friction is reduced in the purchase equation. And that's relatively new. It used to be really much more about the tangible aspects of the mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But that, that thought that easy equals right in the consumer, it's a little psychological hack there, right? That if it's the easy or something that seems to me the writer it feels to me it's it's a shortcut it's not necessarily always the safest shortcut but it doesn't make any le less real y yeah. you talk a lot in the book about these uh mental shortcuts about the uh, various heuristics that customers are gonna that consumers are gonna carry around uh let's get into that a little bit because uh, already in this conversation you've hit on two of my favorite subjects uh daniel kahneman who i would read the phone book if he wrote it <laughs> and uh um and to wine. So so we're all good. So so uh, let's talk about that even to the point of of uh, of pricing theory. You, you had a great discussion in the book about pricing theory and about how people assess wine. And and I just think about that from the perspective of if I'm standing in the wine aisle and I don't know what I'm looking at, what do I do? Where does my mind go? Can you address that? Yeah, it's so interesting. And one of the things that cracks me up about my field is how many studies are done on wine. Because I keep <laughs> thinking like, okay, so then we get done with the research and well, what are we going to do with the wine? I mean, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's, maybe that's entered <laughs> that's into right. it. I haven't yeah. personally done any research on wine, but I'm sitting yeah. in wine country right now thinking this would be a really excellent idea for mm -hmm. my next project. Sure, but absolutely. Anyway, yeah. I think my favorite study in that field um, has to do with pricing, and that's mm -hmm. that um, if people are told um, that they're drinking a more expensive wine, they actually really like it better. And I think this is such a parallel to so many of the things that we buy. We don't we don't instinctively know how much things should cost. This is true for you know, cars and clothes and wine and so many of the toothpaste, we, we kind of don't really know. So we rely on pricing cues and other 
um, nonverbal cues, symbolics, um, to help us understand how much something should cost. And we sort of logically understand that things that cost more probably are better. And so interestingly enough, you know, wine is one of the most mysterious products out there. I mean, people generally don't understand wine. That would include me, by the way. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand why one wine would cost more, but they do have this sense that more expensive wine must be better. And therefore, if you tell them a wine is more expensive, they will actually report enjoying it more than the cheaper wine. It's interesting because it's not just a perception at that point. It's not just a price value connection <clears throat> or heuristic. Uh, I'm actually convincing my own brain that yeah. this is better wine uh, simply based on the price that I have seen for it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. They enjoy it more. So it's not, I want it more mm -hmm. because it's expensive. It's, it tastes better. It's yeah. changed their perception of the product. I think this is one of the reasons the luxury category is so topsy turvy because so it used to be the quality of um, the way that it's made, the hand stitching or whatever. Um, you know, this, this all costs money. Consumers could logically kind of make that assumption in their mind and they could understand that they're getting something that will feel better, perform better, last longer and so forth because of it. But then the fashion world changed so much that, you know, rips and exposed seams and things that consumers don't equate with quality mm -hmm. are also, you know, in that luxury category. And this is like across the board. I mean, people really just can't make sense of pricing and therefore they a lot of times look for these other um, symbolic cues to understand quality. Let's continue this because I think the psychology of pricing is incredibly fascinating. But I also, in my own observation as a practitioner, I see organizations get this so very wrong and to the point where they are actually assassinating their own value at the time that they think that they're adding value. So on the one hand, we know that people love a, a great bargain, right? And you talk ah, about yeah. this in the in the book. You you talk about the allure of the bargain and mm -hmm. the whole idea of, you know, the, the the fear of missing out and the rationalization that has to take place and everything along. But 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 on the other hand, uh, when we see this item that's right from the very beginning, it's marked as 50% off. And, you know, today only it's a special 20% more. And if you have a coupon, it's, it's another 10% pretty soon. It's, you know, take the shirt and I'll give you $5. Is that what it feels like? <laughs> and I end up so dramatically devaluing the product even before I pick it up off of the rack, simply because I've been told by that company, uh, this is not worth very much. Exactly. That is such an important point and so true. And we're in this constant race to the bottom. I think it started during the recession when people really just wouldn't buy anything unless it was on sale because they were very, very afraid. And, you know, and that was genuine. I mean, those reductions were genuine because, you know, consumers just weren't buying any other way and stores were flooded with merchandise. And for consumers, it was genuine. And then the whole thing just became perverted. And what happened there is that consumers consumers decided when they started spending again, they said, well, wait a minute. I, I you know, I used to get these things at half off it, you know, 40, 80% off. I, that's how I shop. Now I want those bargains and retailers were kind of looking at that whole equation and saying, well, we can't like make any money at all mm -hmm. <laughs> under those mm -hmm. circumstances. Right. So they started creating these kind of fake bargain situations where they would, you know, and consumers became kind of like part of the game. So it turned into this, game that everybody's losing because consumers really aren't, I think, spending money wisely when they're focused more on the bargain than they are and what they're actually buying. And businesses, of course, are eroding the value of their right. products and their margins in the process. So to me, what makes sense is to look at, okay, what's the psychological need that's being fulfilled by that bargain? And I think primary is trust. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, one of the great changes um, that we've noticed in society is this erosion of trust in everything, in the government and businesses in you know, religious institutions, certainly in the media and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is consumers feel like they need some kind of proof or validation when they're spending money that they're not being taken advantage of, enter the bargain and that problem is solved. So I think what we can do is, you know, businesses need to find another way 
to validate their products and their pricing, either through social media or their reputation in some way to enhance that trust, rather than to keep going down that bargain route, which, as you pointed out, has no good ending, ex- you know, mm-hmm. except yeah. for brands losing their value. And I think the other thing people are looking for with bargains is a, a reason to buy something. So our use of the internet has really made every product we could possibly want available all the time, which makes it, you know, one of the things that retailers always relied on was this sense of, if I don't buy it now, it might not be there later, or I don't want to get to the store again. All of that is irrelevant now. And so what we have to do is give people a reason to buy now. And bargains have been that reason for Mm -hmm. the past five or six years. Mm -hmm. I better get it now or might not be there, or, oh, this is a special limited time sale. So there's other ways like limiting the offerings that you have, Mm -hmm. making offerings location specific, creating other reasons um, to give people either a rationalization to buy now or a fear of missing out or, you know, proof of their shopping prowess. Um, You know, there's other ways, I think, to get that psychological gratification and reason for purchase that people have been getting through bargains. You know, let me throw this out there and I'll I'll tell you about sort of how I have approached this as I've worked with groups before. And then I want you to give me the kind of psychological background behind it. One of the things that I I learned, I don't know if this is original thought from the work of Kahneman and Tversky, but the whole idea of the endowment effect and that we tend to value something or, or esteem it more highly after we have actually purchased it. And yet, if we're getting something that's on sale and we're getting it because it's on sale, it seems to have a countering effect. So I will ask audiences, you know, how many of you have an item of clothing that you have owned for 30 days or more and it still has a price tag on it? And invariably, an overwhelming majority of hands are going to go up for people who said yes. And then I ask the question, did you get that item on sale? And sure enough, the answer <laughs> was still yes. But then I'll ask people, the same audience, how many of you are wearing an item of clothing that you paid full price for? You know you paid full price for it, but you're still wearing it right now. And again, the hands shoot up. And then I ask the question, did you get it on sale? And no hands go up. So there is this idea of how much we esteem something according to how much of a discount mentality that we took into it. Unpack that a little for us. Oh my gosh, you just hit one of my favorite articles I've ever written. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this for uh, time, I I think about a year and a half ago, why we have things in our closets um, that we haven't worn or have the price take on. I can't remember the title they picked, but it was my by far most popular article I've ever written. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons was that you know, we, that the bargains kind of inspire us to buy things that we don't actually need or want. I mean, that's hugely part of it. But, you know, other reasons like that, you know, when we're shopping online, we can be shopping when we're tired or tipsy or Mm -hmm. (laughs) any number of other things that, you know, that people buy like they, they have one in black and it's beautiful on them and they love it. And then the yellow one goes on sale. And so they decide to buy that one. So, you know, again, we're just stuffing ourselves full of things that, um, aren't necessarily the perfect thing for us. They're the bargain thing for us. And the gratification we're getting from that is the thrill of, um, you know, the hunt Mm -hmm. more than the thrill of the product, which absolutely, I think, makes that whole um, equation of valuing what we have more than what we don't have kind of a a little less relevant today than it was um, when that theory was first introduced. Hmm. You know, it's interesting because my sense is that when we introduce a price fixation too early into the process, that we actually cloud the thinking of a prospect of a customer who is considering a purchase. And, and I'm just thinking recently when my wife and I purchased a mattress and and being in two different stores and the first store had the prices uh, and the special promotions, of course, that they always have, uh, but the prices were sitting there on top of every single bed. Here's the price for a, you know, a twin and a full and a queen and a king. So, so as you move from bed to bed to bed, you could immediately differentiate by price. But the other store that we went to, and by the way, the store where we actually bought the mattress, 
on the mattress was a description of the bed and you actually had to open this little portfolio to see the prices underneath. And what what it caused us to do is to say, okay, well, well, let's foc we're, we're focusing in here on the bed. And then when we see a bed that piques our interest for some reason other than price, now we had to open this little flap to see what the price was afterwards. And what it caused us to do ultimately was to make the decision for the right reasons, right? And then secondly, we bought a much more expensive bed than we thought we were going to spend. <laughs> so yeah. what happened? What happened in my mind, Kit? Well, I'm thinking that somehow or another you had trust for that store you went into. That's true. So, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. So I think the first thing that any retailer has to do is in order to get people to spend a little bit longer looking at the product before the price is to make sure that in some way consumers, the, the shopper will know that they're not going to be taken advantage of in that store. So, uh, you know, a longtime mattress dealer with a good reputation of fairness and so on, or a mattress dealer that has, um, you know, a special promotion, like everything's going to be on sale. So just look at what you like and don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. But in some way, consumers won't spend a lot of time exploring prices or exploring product characteristics until they feel like they can trust the retailer. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, a a lot of times that goes along with a sale, but increasingly, I think there's room for retailers to get that trust, um, especially through social media today, which is just such a powerful way um, for consumers to talk to other consumers and elevate a retailer. But isn't that also just the role of the representative, the sales representative, for example? Or a salesperson, uh, you know, absolutely. If I look at, if you you go back to Robert Cialdini's book on influence theory, and, and he talks about likability being one of the key influencers, and there's just this sort of shortcut in my mind. It doesn't necessarily have to be dead on accurate, to make to be real but as a consumer if i like you i am more likely to trust you if i trust you i will be influenced by you uh so there's that direct through line from likability into trust yes Yes, absolutely. I do think it's more complicated today, though, because we're working from an absolute and complete trust deficit. Mm -hmm. So it, do you ever see, uh, I, I, I always rely on the Edelman Trust Barometer that comes out every year. And this year's 2017s came out about a month ago, and it was shocking. I mean, we're down to like people endorsing trust of businesses, government, media, as down to like single digit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the lowest it's ever been. So I think it has to be, you know, I think it has to be an even more pronounced part of the retail equation. If retailers are going to, um, you know, if retailers are going to be successful, I think they're either going to have to just continue to rely on bargains as a shorthand term for trust, mm -hmm. or they're going to have to get endorsement from other consumers in some way. Mm -hmm. But I think likability is definitely part of it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just like we're they're coming from so far behind the curve today. Sure. Um, and we almost need more. I right. A little booster shot. Yeah. And b by the way, you pegged me on the mattress store. It's a it's a family owned business in my town, and uh, one of my best friends is uh, good friends with the owner of the company. There was an inherent trust before I walked through the door. That other store, mattress store, that I was telling you about is a national firm, and uh, I, there was really no inherent trust when I walked through the door. So yeah, you had it pegged. <laughs> Uh, Kit Yarrow, just absolutely amazing. Uh, I wanted to encourage anybody who's listening, uh, hop on over to kityarrow.com, K-I-T-Y-A-R-R-O-W.com. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. But you can learn about Kit, you can buy the book, uh, you can read the articles. Uh, and if you're an organization that's looking for a really top-notch speaker, well, you just heard right here how talented uh, Kit is. Kit, I can't thank you enough. Fascinating, fascinating conversation. And if it's okay with you, I'd love to have you uh, back because I think we covered about, oh, maybe <laughs> three and a half percent of uh, the book here. I had a blast. Thank you so much. I'll come back anytime. Appreciate that. Uh, Murph, how great was that? Was Kit Yarrow like the perfect guest for this show? Okay, so how many guests have we had mentioned Daniel Kahneman? Because yeah, I'll I'm thinking I should get paid a bonus every time somebody <laughs> mentions Daniel Kahneman. That's right. Daniel Kahneman, if you're listening out there, come on the show. Uh, but it tells you a little bit about Daniel Kahneman's legacy because he's cer certainly one of the most respected people out there. But I got to tell you, uh, Kit Yarrow has a legacy of her own. That's some really, really good stuff. 
She does know, and I really enjoyed uh, trying to get my head wrapped around how we buy with emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that we've talked about that on the program before, but right. uh, in this particular case, I was trying to figure out, okay, what is it that I'm doing uh, you know, when I'm making a purchase that is so emotionally driven? And mm -hmm. she really addressed a lot of those topics. Right, yeah. Uh, it, it was interesting because I have a whole bunch of questions that I did not get to because we ended up just talking about the psychology of price most of the time, which, is, again, we'll have to have Kit uh, back uh, to go into other areas. But to me, looking at her takes on the psychology of price and how damaging it can be when we're putting that price first viewpoint or lens by which we see a product, we're probably going to get in trouble. And, you know, that whole idea of, you know, you, you bought something and the price tag on, is still on it. And you heard Kit talk about this, right? Because she had that article that resonated so much because we've all done it. So it, what, here's what it comes down to. The idea that we make these fully logical decisions is pure folly. Uh, the idea here, there is logic that goes behind our decisions, but ultimately we are emotional creatures and we make emotion-based decisions. Great interview with uh, Kit Yarrow. Well, as we head into the wrap up, I wanna hit on one other thing as we've been talking about the psychology of pricing today. And I'm gonna recommend to you that part of your job as a sales professional is to save your customer from himself, okay? Uh, let me tell you what I mean by that. The price is an enabler, that's it. The price is there as a value exchange. Now look, they may talk about it early on, but this is not what is most important to them. Talking about price early in the process is a learned behavior that they think that they're supposed to do, but that does not make it most important. What's most important is that they want to satisfy a need. They want to alleviate a pain. They want to move to a better future. You're not, I'll tell you somebody that you're not gonna have a price discussion with, and that's somebody who has no problem. You are only talking to them in the first place because they have a problem. Many salespeople dig deep into price way too early. And I'll tell you why I think they do that. I think it's fear-based more than anything else. They're afraid of having to defend the cost, and so they jump in first as sort of a preemptive strike. But you're better than that. You understand the emotional needs of your customer, and you know that the sooner you drag them into a price conversation, the more detached they get from their emotion. You know that they want to make a decision from their soul first, not primarily from their wallet. So I just want to ask you, do yourself and your customer a favor. Sell the way they want to buy. Find the problem, solve the problem, and then the price conversation will all fall into play. Well, listen, if you like our podcast, really appreciate it if you would subscribe to that. And if you love it, a review would mean even more. You can go to iTunes to do that. Consider posting a link to this podcast on your social media page. We sure appreciate that. But that's a wrap on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Hope you enjoyed it. You can find everything you need at jeffshore.com. But until next time, go out there, my friends, and change someone's world.